Good afternoon and welcome to the Justice Committee's 19th meeting of 2019. We have apologies from Jenny Ruth, Fulton McGregor and Liam Kerr, and I'm pleased to welcome Maurice Corrie, who's substituting for Liam Kerr to the committee. Agenda item number one is our only business today, and it's an evidence session on the interim report on the independent review of complaints handling investigations and misconduct issues in relation to policing. And I'm pleased to welcome to the committee today the Right Honourable Dean Ailey Shangelini, Ian Kernahan, Head of the Secretariat, and Paul Allen, Member of the Secretariat, supporting Dean Ailey. I refer members to paper one, which is a private paper, and um, I invite Dean Ailey to make a uh, uh, to make some opening remarks. Before you do so, can I thank you for providing a copy of the report to the committee. Dame English. Thank you, convener, uh, and thank you for the invitation to, to meet with you today. Uh, my independent review commenced, as you may recollect, in September uh, of uh, last year, and my mandate from Scottish ministers is to make recommendations that will help to strengthen public confidence in policing in Scotland, apropos the issue of complaints uh, and their investigation uh, and misconduct matters. Since then, I've undertaken over 80 interviews with individuals and have held over 30 meetings and uh, led two focus groups uh, uh, in discussions. And the first report that you have before you is a preliminary report which uh, sets out uh, the nature of the, the high-level analysis of the functions of, of the organisations and the problems which have been identified to me at this stage. There are a number of significant issues clearly uh, contained in that report, but there are still a number of matters still to be dealt with, which I will now move to in particular. One of the major issues is about victim uh, or complainer uh, participation in the process as well and how that's supported, uh, and also the issue of whistleblowing. So there are major issues, as well as looking at uh, some of the more significant propositions for structural change, uh, which may arise uh, as a result of uh, further deliberations. I will also be uh, visiting the uh, investigator, uh, the, the individual responsible for investigating complaints against the police, the Pony Organisation in Northern, uh, Northern Ireland, and also going back down to England uh, to the IOPC for more interview and discussions with those who are currently implementing some of the new changes there. Uh, we've also had visits with the Home Office officials. As you know, the English and Welsh are about to have a whole new set of regulations governing their procedures, so uh, I didn't want to be unduly influenced by that. I wanted to look at what I consider to be the issues here, but also clearly there's uh, some resonance in what they've been doing based on the Taylor and Chapman reports to changing their procedures uh, in England and Wales. So those are the only comments I'd like to, to uh, make at this stage, is to say that I hope to have uh, further uh, public engagement, further engagement with officers uh, at all levels as well, to hear from them. There's been a very significant number of submissions as well from organisations, and I'm particularly grateful for those. And I ha have to say the fullest of cooperation from all of the four major organisations and agencies involved in this matter. That's very encouraging. Thank you. We now move to questions, starting with Daniel Johnson. Thank you, convener. And can I too extend my thanks to Dame Eilish for coming along, giving, uh, giving us the opportunity to see one another on a Monday, uh, which is novel. Um, I'd just like to begin uh, with the four agencies that you just mentioned. I was struck by paragraph 277 in your report, uh, talking about the professionalism with which the organisations approach their work, but then commenting... What has, however, become clear through the evidence to the review and from recent media coverage, and as a matter of serious concern, is that certain aspects of those relationships, and that is between the, the four agencies, are suboptimal and characterised by an absence of constructive engagement and coloured by a tone of cynicism. And indeed, in the subsequent sentences in that paragraph, you use the word suspicion three times. I, I was very concerned when I was reading that. I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate on how you would characterise this relationship and indeed what the consequences of this apparent uh, suspicion that exists and are there any particular re relationships between the four organisations, i.e. between particular ones which are of particular concern to you? Yes, the, well, I think probably because this committee has led evidence on these matters during the course of the consideration of the Act, it would have been evident that there are tensions uh, between these organisations. And tension is, it, it, 
to some extent it's not a bad thing, it's natural. However, uh, very often the issue of independence is one which is mistaken for isolation. And isolation, of course, under, undermines independence. Uh, and therefore, it, the, the important thing is that while each of them have constitutional roles to carry out, what is very important uh, in regard to that is that there is a, not just simply token uh, interaction, but there is regular interaction to understand each other, to understand the problems, the, uh, the challenges, uh, what's good, what's positive and what's not going right, so that that becomes a dynamic which drives continual improvement, which is what a great deal of this is about. Uh, what seem to be uh, the case is that certainly the, the relationship between the police uh, seem to be uh, concerned uh, with the disposition that was uh, they felt was coming from the perk towards them, one of, of suspicion, and that uh, clearly if you are investigating, the mindset you have as an investigator has to be an open mind. It has to be one that's not prejudiced or jaundiced, eh, because jaundice is not impartiality. It, it's, it's got to be one which doesn't judge the organisation on the basis of what's gone before necessarily as a continuum, but looking at each case afresh eh, and contributing more widely where you do find things which are wrong to continual improvement. Uh, and, and that was something which um, it, it was given, what was really marked in the evidence, particularly from uh, a number of the police officers, was this, this view that they felt that, uh, that there was this uh, sort of cynicism about them, that somehow that there were you know, conspiracy, conspiracies afoot, etc. when in fact they were trying to do a job. Whether they were getting it right is another matter, but whether or not people were actually somehow conspiring uh, to get things wrong. This is the, this was the feeling of the, uh, that was coming over uh, in the evidence. Uh, certainly, it, in terms of any particular organisation, I think the relationship between um, the prosecution and the police seemed to be a, a, work, a workable relationship, which was, again, quite clearly independent, but there was a, a clear, uh, I'd say, respect for the individual uh, organisations. And that uh, that was also reflected, I think, in relationship with between the, the prosecution and the, the PERC. Uh, and I don't think there was any issue. The real issue seems to be uh, the, 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 the relationship and the tone which was coming from, or perceived to be coming from, the PERC organisation towards the police. Uh, and as a result of a, a degree of cynicism, that uh, they, are, they, are, they were almost uh, a, a sort of rebuttable presumption of, of guilt of, of doing something behind anything that was found at that time. And that, that uh, also in a sense of not being able to really get relationships going in the way that they had. Now, can I say that that began to change during the course of my review, because it's something I commented on at an early stage, because obviously having read the transcripts of this committee's important uh, review into that that matter. I was concerned with what, what was uh, being said at that stage. So the the what I asked at the very beginning was what degree of joint training was taking place. And I think hitherto not very much. So the organisations did not, notwithstanding they had very common interests and very, very significant need to know about each other, to understand, for instance, how do you train a police officer to restrain someone? What is it they're being taught? Uh, what is it like to be out on a Friday night, uh, you know, when the streets are full of someone who uh, people who are drunk or uh, disorderly? How, what does it take? What type of issues might uh, an officer, even at a police constable level or a higher level, have to deal with? Those require a practical and quite an acute professionalism and understanding. It's not something which you simply get from reading uh, from a report in an almost laboratory condition where you can look, make a clinical assessment of someone's conduct you know, maybe months or days afterwards. It does require an integration and understanding of what they are learning, what's wrong perhaps with what they're learning in order to have that understanding. Uh, and that's something which I, I raised in, in a, a debate with the, the PERC and with uh, others within the other organisations. Uh, and there was an agreement, there was no resistance to the idea, and indeed the PERC uh, uh, then indicated the number of courses at Jackton, which she had uh, sent her staff along to, to ensure that they were aware of what was being taught, and that that therefore uh, built a greater understanding uh, of what uh, the subject matter is that you're dealing with. Thank you. That's helpful. I mean, it strikes me that what you're, you're saying is that it's, it's, was a, it's a sort of a culture of... of uh, suspicion that but not necessarily born out of 
reality. And, and therefore, I'm just wondering whether or not, if that's about, it's about perception of individuals within the organisation, whether your recommendations, which are largely at a kind of a governance level, yes. w will they really be sufficient to, to, to break down those? And, and I was also just, uh, were there any specific worries? Because again, in, in paragraph 283, you you talk about there the, the being evident of non-sharing of certain information. So I'm just wondering, is it just a generalised issue, Sorry. or were, were there specific issues that you found of? Could you contextualise the last comment? You refer to paragraph. So in, two, so in, in paragraph two eight three. What um, does it say there? It says the evidence suggests that improving communications uh, uh, communication between organisations needs to be addressed. Uh, the evident non-sharing of certain uh, information between organisations concerns me. And then you go on to talk about uh, memorandums of understanding uh, being in existence, but for very short time frames. I was just wondering if, you were, if you'd found any specific instances of information that should have been shared between the organisations that, that should have. And, and again, whether or not your recommendations, uh, which are largely at a governance level, would address that. Yeah, I, th I think one of the, the interesting aspects is that um, you asked about whether or not it relates to specifics. But there are, for instance, one of the, the features which uh, you you may be aware of is that each of the organisations has a standard documents. Mm -hmm. Most of these are elderly. They predate the legislation. They haven't been updated. So from sanctions to solutions was a creation of the previous uh, PERC. Um, the, the Lord Advocate's guidelines are elderly. Uh, as well, and some of the training which was uh, uh, being relied on by the police officers in the professional standards department of the police, it was piecemeal, uh, and you got together from ACQUEST guidance from 2006 and earlier periods. So there was, what concerned me was they were all looking at different types of sources for their training uh, and for their guidance, uh, and that there didn't appear to be any subsequent crossover between the organisations to look at what they were collectively doing to address the issues which came from, from the Act and the subject matter of complaints handling and investigations. So you'll see that one of my recommendations that I make now is that there should be a cross-organisational working group set mm -hmm. up to look at their individual training and, and deliberately suggest that they all should be party to that because I think it's important that when they are developing it, they are aware and privy of the, uh, the policies, the, uh, the limitations and the challenges of the work of the other so that they're not doing that in isolation. I also think this high-level working group uh, would also be very useful in taking forward closer working among these organisations. And by closer, it doesn't mean to say cosy. That independence is absolutely critical for all of them. So, certainly, the police follow the directions of the Lord Advocate, uh, and uh, but the uh, other organisations can work together collaboratively without compromising their independence or having that um, that continuing of a, a, a disposition to think that that that, that there is somehow a, a contemptuous attitude towards the other organisation by didn't all of them having got it wrong because why they've got it wrong is what's really important. How can you find a solution to that? And the whole ethos of what was it, the, the, the essence of uh, the, the perk of from sanctions to solutions hasn't been changed. And that's moving away from a culture of a punitive approach to this to a, 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 a problem-solving approach so that you have continuing improvement in, our, in the organisations. And I think that that's really important. And I think having watched this as an outsider, you know, from, from Oxford and looking into it uh, you know, here, it did appear that very much of it uh, was based on relationships which, to, to all intents and purposes, appear to have broken down. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. And I, and, and I note what you you've said there about the, the, the relationships need to be at a distance, but 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 also uh, not too distant. But but managing that independence. Uh, and I, I I would also like to ask you about the relationship between Police Scotland and the SPA, because mm. earlier in your report, I think you note that at times that relationship has become has been too close. Mm. And indeed, I mean, I note your the the the, the comments that you make in paragraph one eight two about um, the SPA uh, should consider. Uh, having its powers to, to remove uh, uh, its powers of investigation for senior officers and that being placed by a, a committee um, uh, led by the judiciary. 
And is that principally what you're, you're concerned about? Is that that role with the, of, that the SPA has to investigate senior officers? Well, and indeed, is that, is that something that you'd like to see taken forward immediately? And, and are there any other concerns you have about the proximity between Police Scotland well, there's several, the several questions there, yeah. so I'll try and recollect some of them. If I, if I miss any of them, you could perhaps remind me of, of what those were. But the, the, the first one it was about the, what, what, where my concerns about the relationship with the, uh, the Police Scotland and the SPA of the same nature. No, a, a different sort of quality there, because what, what is close about them seems to be quite legitimate. It's what you would expect in that it, the SPA is a small organisation, uh, and the, the group of senior officers who deal with them, uh, namely the assistant chief constables, the deputy chief constable, the chief constable, uh, have weekly, uh, if not more often, work of being there to be accountable to the various committees of the Scottish Police Authority, for instance, for the efficacy of their organisation, their efficiency, uh, and for the accountability issues. So there are several committees which you would have chief constables coming into finance committee, strategic committee, their IT committee, etc., where they are looking to either gain resources or gain authority or acceptance of, of, of their policies. By dint of that, they're sitting around a table, they're having a cup of coffee, um, uh, they're, they're getting to know these people on, on that basis, as you do in a small country. Uh, and then you have a committee, a subcommittee of that board as a discipline committee, then determining if a complaint uh, is to be uh, upheld and if what the, the penalty, the whole process of, of adjudicating on the credibility and reliability of the officer as you would in a disciplinary proceeding elsewhere in the, uh, in the police service is actually populated by the same people who you are working with almost regularly. And I think that that situation, how I would describe it, I suppose colloquially, would be too cosy. It's just too uh, intimate a situation because of the numbers and the sheer scale or lack of scale for that really to be seen. And, and it's about seen and perception, to seen to be impartial. Uh, and uh, it, it, I think, therefore, it's important that while the functions of the SPA are, are critical to the buffer between government and the police and to ensuring accountability for the service, that this aspect of conduct I don't think sits well because of the very small number of chief officers that they're dealing with. So they know them all. Uh, and as a result of that, I think it'd be much better for there to be a legally chaired independent panel established to deal with complaints against senior police officers uh, where, they be, where, they, where they come to a, 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 an issue of miscon alleged misconduct. Not a member of the judiciary. I, I suggested that the Lord President should appoint a, a, the, uh, a legally independent chair. Now, that's not unusual. It happens in England and Wales. Uh, it also happens in England and Wales for all of the... Uh, junior officers, if we call them uh, those, which are below the level of a senior officer. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not it's absolutely necessary. I'm not sure whether or not you require it for misconduct, but I would also extend that, recommend, I have extended, suggested extending that to accusations of gross misconduct against officers in the lower uh, 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 ranks, as well as those for senior ranks, to ensure that there is this impartiality and that the public can have confidence uh, in that also. And I think that that's uh, the basis of that recommendation. Just finally, and just on the, on the, sort of the technicalities of your recommendations, that point about the legally independent chair for that tribunal, yes. that, that's not actually specifically in any of your, your, your recommendations? No, it's, you'll see that there are several suggestions yeah. within this. This, this, is a, this is a difficult preliminary yeah. report. I have put a number of suggestions in the report for, for, for further feedback and for give people the opportunity uh, while I'm still gathering evidence and seeking evidence to be able to respond to those propositions uh, and to see whether or not uh, there are alternative approaches which might be more attractive uh, by the close of that. But looking at it, um, it, it's important. You may, someone may come to the issue about the preliminary assessment. That was another aspect of, of the role, which was, uh, is rendered difficult partly because of the, the legislative provision for it, which uh, makes it very difficult to know precisely what it is that you're supposed to be looking mm -hmm. for. Um, and that certainly needs to be clarified. But that's the, the, the situation where someone is receiving the complaint in SP. Someone basically posts an email to them or a letter or whatever, uh, an anonymous phone call, and what they do with that, what they make of that, uh, and uh, uh, how they approach that process uh, in terms of their statutory obligation. But the, but the aspect of determining uh, whether or not a senior officer 
if you, you think about the implications, if mm -hmm. it's a senior officer for the country, are very, very significant, mm -hmm. should be seen to be an impartial process and one which has a legally chaired, I think, because of the implications uh, for the country that come from uh, those types of proceedings. Thank you very much. Okay. John Vinney. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good afternoon, Dean Ellis, and thank you and your team for your work. Take you off in a totally different direction, if I may, Dean Ellis. Uh, the casual observer looking at your remit might be surprised that you found yourself commenting on um, grievance procedures. I think it's wholly appropriate that, that you did. I, I wonder if you could comment, on, and you talk about raising awareness and understanding. Um, it might seem that some of these issues that built a huge head of steam could have been resolved with mm. appropriate resolution. Mm. dealt with as a, an HR function rather yes. than resorting to it being cons ultimately being conceived as con a misconduct issue. Could you comment on that? Please? Well, I, I think that it's really important because although grievance isn't part of it, it's an explanation for why perhaps things are not as, as good as it can be in this context. Because, as you know, any police constable is not an employee. They hold an office. But apart from that, legislative provision, to all intents and purposes, they are very similar in every way because they're subject to orders and command. It's a very hierarchical, very deferential uh, a, a structure that they have. But within the group of, I think it's 15,000, I'll be corrected if the numbers are wrong, 15,000 police constables? 17,000. 17,000. 17,000 17, 17, 17, police constable or police officers, of whom about 15,000, I think, are police constables and two and a half approximately are sergeants. Well, if you look at that, that's a very flat organisation in terms of promotion opportunities. So you have a lot of people, and I understand the average uh, term before a police constable is promoted from constable to sergeant is 15 years. Now, the, if you have an organisation as flat as that, opportunities for promotion are few and far between, uh, and therefore all sorts of issues come about why have I not been promoted? Uh, why has X been promoted? There can be all sorts of uh, difficulties in per in what you would call ordinary personnel. There's also been a reduction uh, in the number of sergeants in Scotland, uh, and therefore you have fewer with wider management spans, however we characterise it, they've got more constables. And what's really important in any organisation is mentoring uh, and intervention at an early stage where um, conduct begins to, people are maybe absent more often than, than not, or maybe being more rude or more inconsiderate, or there's enmities beginning to build up and you intervene in a, an HR context. Now, there is an HR organisation for Police Scotland, but it doesn't seem to be one which is resorted to in the way that any of us would recognise in other organisations. And I think that, uh, uh, that there is a tendency, or perhaps traditionally, to resort to discipline more rapidly than you would expect. It's escalated to discipline more rapidly than if there was a very strong tradition of HR intervention with grievance procedures, etc., being used in the way that they would be in civilian uh, organisations. And therefore, that's something I really want to look into. The, the HMIC was also uh, concerned that the, she described it as you know, going from flash to bang sometimes with uh, uh, episodes. And so I think that what we've got to understand is that we uh, I see in the report, we ask a huge amount of police officers. We're asking them to go into events which none of us, I suspect here, unless some of you have been police officers, you have indeed, John, I think, in the past, you might have wanted to, or, or at least would have run into situations which most of us would run away from. Uh, but we ask a great deal of them. Um, and if you're doing that constantly, dealing with terrible you know, car crashes, etc., and tragedies, looking for uh, lost people, um, with that, there is a, there is a, a cost to emotional uh, stability over time. There is a, a corrosive effect. Uh, and therefore, it's really important that there are interventions to support people at an early stage before other habits are taken up, such as resort to alcohol uh, or, or indeed medication or, or be becoming violent uh, in your disposition. All of that, can, and therefore, we have, I think, a real obligation to ensure, and it may sound as if this is a very soft issue, but I think it's absolutely critical, is that those interventions uh, take place at uh, as early a stage as possible to prevent some of the behaviours which then manifest themselves later on and bring them into the misconduct uh, field, perhaps, as a result of some of those features. And uh, therefore, th that's what uh, I was referring to when I talked about the, the HR function. I don't think it I, is being exploited as fully as it, as it could be. Uh, and I think there should be greater emphasis on that. I'd like to look at that more fully and come back to you in, in, in my full report regarding that. 
thank you. It's certainly, it's reassuring to hear you address the issue in that way because, of course, the overwhelming majority of police officers and police staff go about their duties in an impeccable way and deliver yes, a course. very good service. And the danger is that there's a focus on uh, a small number. You, you talk about a, a proportionate response to emulsion. And the other thing I, I wanted to ask you briefly about was training in mediation and customer handling, because it would seem, again, that might be viewed as a very soft issue, mm -hmm. but the ability within the organisation to rapidly escalate things, mm -hmm. these would seem to be a very important factor. Mm. Well, again, it, emotional intelligence is actually a, a really important feature of any police officer having to go out to the, into the street to deal with anyone. And if you, if you, if you don't understand what confrontation, for instance, if you if you are directory and the police officers, because they have power, can issue a command to someone to be to obtemper the law. However, if you're dealing with someone who has a mental health issue or other issues, they might not have the same cognitive response to the commands that you make of them. Therefore, actually, the, the degree of sophistry that's required in communication with different members of the public is quite demanding of, our, of police officers now. We ask much more of them now than we ever have in the past, and they have to deal with many in our community who are suffering from significant mental health problems, and understanding how to deal with that is, is critical. And that also applies to those who are then considering complaints against officers dealing with that. You cannot really assess the conduct of someone unless you understand the dynamic in which they're operating and the skill set which they require to be able to deal with the, the, the demands uh, which are placed on them. Uh, and, and it's not simply confined to the police. It, it straddles the judiciary, it straddles lawyers and the uh, prosecutors today. We, we have a much more sophisticated understanding of human behaviour, but that doesn't make it easier necessarily to deal with. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, I think that that's critical, uh, that there is that understanding and that, that training uh, is a, uh, available for those who are also handling uh, the complaints which are coming in. They need to be able to listen. Uh, they need to be able to understand how to deal with people who are irate, whether it's by email or by phone call, and be able to respond to it in a way which is going to actually uh, understand the, the, the position these people are in. And that, that training is important for the, 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 those who, who are dealing with it at, the, at that front line. Thank you very much, Dee. Thank you. Okay. Liam Kerr. Oh, sorry, Liam Kerr. It's not even here. And I even when he's not here. here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've hit a sorry new low that. this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Dame Ellis, can I thank you, um, not just for your report, but actually for the way in which you've engaged with members of this committee in the preparation of the interim report. That's greatly uh, appreciated. Um, we've just talked there uh, with John Finney's line of questioning around um, the, the welfare of, of officers. And I think in relation to an issue that's arisen um, on a few occasions with this committee about former officers being able to retire and then uh, proceedings in relation to uh, misconduct or even gross misconduct uh, are then parked. I, I, I think you quite rightly make the point that nobody would wish to prevent a, 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 an officer who is genuinely ill and uh, under stress from, from retiring. But I think you, you say in your uh, report, it does not appear compatible with the principles of natural justice, especially where the alleged misconduct is associated with detriment to members of the public. There's a major issue of public interest at stake for those to use what you describe as an escape, uh, an escape route. Uh, you then suggest that there may be merit um, in terms of the public interest and transparency and justice in adopting a, an approach that, that is uh, in, in place in, in England and Wales, which suggests that your, your, your mind's not made up on this, that you can see strengths and, and weaknesses of it. Uh, but you then go on to, to, to set out what appears to be uh, a fairly credible way of, of, of moving down this route. Are, are you able to advise the committee where your current thinking is in terms of, of, of trying to amend the, the rules in this area? Well, it was only published on Friday, so pretty much where I was on Friday. Right. Uh, 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 this is Monday. <laughs> Always good no, to check. But, uh, <laughs> not, not so malleable. But the... the uh, the difficulty is, and, and, and really my concern here is with allegations of gross misconduct, because, you know, the, the, there are, again, is the proportionality of this and looking at, at what, what, what would be appropriate. But if there's an allegation by, uh, if there's an allegation of gross misconduct and proceedings are, are commenced and during the course of those someone retires, uh, then the, the, in a normal job, of course, that would be the end of the matter. It, it, it resolves it. The person goes and the, the problem that's alleged it just simply evaporates. However, in policing, it, it, it's different because it's a public. The police officers have very considerable powers uh, as an officer. They have considerable obligations as well, but they have power. Uh, and it's a public 
uh, conduct which we are, we are concerned with. And therefore, if there is a very serious matter that is being uh, in, uh, the subject of uh, such uh, uh, proceedings and the individual there, uh, thereafter resigns or retires during that, the, the, the proceedings are not brought to any conclusion. They're left and no one knows what the position was regarding that. Now, I'm not suggesting that someone is, is kept in the police in perpetuity and cannot resign and, and, and I think there's been judicial consideration of that. But there is a question as to whether or not the proceedings should continue in order that a conclusion can be reached regarding those now, there's two issues there. Would the conclusions thereafter have any effect on the individual if they have resigned? Uh, and therefore, uh, is it simply a, a, a hollow exercise? I, I don't think so. If it, it, a conclusion can be reached, which then allows uh, the authorities to advise, and this is the second part of that equation, any other police force in the country, uh, at, or indeed in England and Wales, uh, about the fact that this is, has taken place uh, and what the conclusion is, because there is a real public interest in ensuring uh, that if I leave, uh, let's say, um, the police here and move off to another police force, that that police force uh, elsewhere should be aware of the outcome of those proceedings uh, or what has happened. And in England and Wales, there is a, a vetting and barring uh, register that takes place. So that if someone leaves during uh, the course of proceedings in one force in England and Wales and, and moves to another, that that's something which can be consulted as to whether or not that person ha has been barred uh, and uh, whether or not there is a matter of concern. And I think that's something which should be introduced in Scotland and I think it should be cross-border. I think it, because we have sufficient movement of officers across to ensure that people are aware. And I think part of that, that is part of the equation which relates to what I've said before. The question uh, that I have is whether or not it would be suf sufficient for a finding to be made without uh, any imposition of penalty. And I also think that any individual who is in those circumstances should also have available to them representation uh, for those proceedings as well. So it's not something. But that's I'm very happy to listen further as to whether or not uh, either of those is to seem to be uh, disproportionate or uh, draconian. And I think that it's important. But I do really think that for gross misconduct, there is a very significant public interest in ensuring that those uh, are uh, completed where it's possible to complete them. One of the ob other observations you made was in relation to the rules around uh, pension forfeiture, and, and you observed that that hasn't actually been used in practice to any great extent. Were you given um, any reasons why that is the case, and, and, and would you see that as uh, another pen, uh, potential sanction in, in the cases you've kind of outlined there? I, I, I think that's the case throughout the United Kingdom, that right. the pension is very... I think there's very, very few examples of of, uh, of pension forfeiture. Reduction in rank is another option, which is one which could be considered as well, which only would exist, obviously, if you were still within the force. Yeah. Uh, as well, but so far as the pension is concerned, the reason that that it probably is not used, and I speculate here because it only comes from two uh, two senior officers, is simply because the officers make their own contributions to that, and there are also there are issues about the, the the rights of family and children regarding that, which you're impacting on. Now that applies to most penalties which impose if you imprison someone, the family is affected by it. But it, but there are issues about proportionality there for for that. It's an option which is available. If you have an independent panel determining it, then th th that whether that changes or not will be a matter on, on whether it's fair or not. But it's not something which I think um, is particularly significant in a motivating factor for resignation, given that it is used so rarely as a penalty. Yeah. And in terms of the, the procedures, you, you talked through the, the, the vetting and barring, which mm. um, presumes that somebody retires from a role but, but is going on, obviously, to potentially perform a, 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 another potentially different role in, in mm -hmm. another force elsewhere in the country. Uh, uh, what other sanctions are, are, are used um, in the system in, in England and Wales that potentially would come into play in a, in a Scottish system? Well, I think nothing very different from what we, for what we have here. The, the only difference you have there is that there are different forces, and therefore there's a lot of movement uh, around England and Wales. It's, now that we have one force here, it's easier to keep an eye uh, on individuals, but it's certainly of importance that if someone does apply for a job, uh, uh, that you, you are aware of, of what took place elsewhere and the fact that someone has gone in those circumstances could be referred to uh, in the, the vetting uh, register is, is important. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Rona. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon. Yes, I'd like to ask you about the time taken to investigate complaints. Um, the committee has heard that um, complaints processes can be prolonged for, for various reasons and that this can often have a detrimental effect on the health of complainants and of the subject of complaints. Police Scotland and the SPA have a non-statutory deadline of 56 days to investigate and conclude complaints, which is often not met for, for a variety of, of reasons, as, as I said. Um, do you think this needs to be reviewed? And also, is it reasonable to assume that not all complaints will be dealt with the same, and so it would be very difficult to uh, introduce standard timescales to complaints? Mm. Well, the answer to your second question is it, yes, they vary considerably. Some are very straightforward and some are hugely complex. They uh, involve obtaining evidence from abroad or experts from abroad uh, and or experts who are uh, experts in a pretty esoteric area, which is so they're not, uh, and therefore even if you've identified an expert, you find that they're so busy that they can't prepare a, com uh, a report for you for another six to eight months. And that's incredibly difficult, but that can happen. Uh, and that happens in ordinary criminal prosecutions as well. So therefore, if you do have targets, one thing you must have is an op opportunity for it not to be an absolute time bar, because that can result in uh, decisions which are not necessarily in the public interest. However, it, 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 you know, if someone is suspended uh, from their role, um, it's an enormous uh, attention for the individual officer and likewise for the families it's incredibly who maybe the, the, or of the individual who's making the complaint they are in the spotlight it's incredibly difficult when it's a long-term thing which they have to suffer too so uh, if you look at where where the delays are very often there is an interaction among the agencies so it's not simply with one it may well be that for instance um the uh, the Park have investigated and have reported to Crown Office. Crown Office will then come back to the Park seeking additional investigation, etc. So therefore, the, it may well be that there's movement between the two, uh, and the, although the case is proceeding again, uh, that, that, that you have those longer periods as well. But undoubtedly, I, I think that the, uh, when I uh, write the full report, the, the issue of time is one which I want to look at, particularly in regarding to uh, the, the nature and scale of them, because some are like somebody complaints in the court. They're very, very quick, They're, and they should be able to be in a very tight time scale. Uh, and those which are identified as being uh, very serious, high profile and complex, and some high, high profile doesn't mean complex necessarily, uh, but if they are of those variables, if you have, then these cases are weighted. And I think the park has a, a system of weighting uh, the nature of those, and I think there's something could be done about that, certainly within Police Scotland as well, to identify what type of complaint it is that they're investigating uh, on behalf. Of course, the police, if it's a criminal matter, are subject to the directions of the prosecutor. So the prosecutor has a power there, the prosecutor fiscal, to direct uh, and to report. Uh, or, or, or direct the police to report within a particular period. So they don't require a time bar uh, for that mm -hmm. because that's the power that the prosecutor has given. Mm -hmm. However, if that means that it's an incomplete investigation that's presented to them, then it's going to go back to them and so it's not a satisfactory mm -hmm. uh, result. But they are, there have been some very lengthy, some very complex, very sensitive investigations which have been bunched together. Uh, over a, a couple of years uh, and you like to hope that that's a, a freak situation where you have that collection sort of like a perfect storm taking place with a number of very significant investigations but there's no guarantee of course that it's not that it will be like that in the future and that's why I'm looking at how you can have a resilience within uh, these organisations which allows greater flexibility to be able to deal with that. You know, certainly if you have a large organisation like the Procurator Fiscal Service, you can draft people in from different parts of the country if you have a major disaster or you have something to be looked at. You can put together large teams. If you have an organisation like the PERC, you're much more limited in terms of your uh, resilience and your ability, certainly the scale of the organisation, to be able to, to call in um, uh, individuals unless you begin to prepare on that basis so that you do have a number of on-call consultants who can come in or those who are retired but who are keeping up their CPD in terms of their training etc to be able to call on uh, because other you, you can't replicate the, the, the police force with the park it would be you know be enormous cost to the public to have a standby investigation for what might happen perhaps once every eight years or so therefore it's trying to find a way of being able to allow the park to carry out their statutory responsibilities whilst not having surplus staff 
uh, for significant other yeah. periods of time. So are we likely to see maybe proposals for streamlining the the um, system in, in your final report? Yes, I, I, or looking at the way, in, looking at the nature of the personnel you have there, because one of the opportunities which I did explore at the beginning was if you look at the complaints handling people uh, and you have your investigative people within PERC, the two quite you see, discreet organisations within PERC, and PERC has given evidence about what she cons considers about complaints handling, but I'm not sure I'm going to be questioned about that later, but she in fact thinks that, that, that complaint handling should be moved elsewhere uh, to the, the Scottish uh, Public Ombudsman, uh, and that, they, that the PERC have instead a, a first instance role of dealing with all the complaints currently dealt with by the police. Now, i discuss that later. But in fact, and part of it, she sees them as quite disparate functions, but actually, I don't think they're that different, because if you're dealing with complaints against how the police have handled cases and, com uh, and complaints or investigations, you're beginning to learn all those skills. You're learning the skills, you're learning the law, you're un the under underlying concepts. But it's quite, a, if you're doing nothing but that, it's it, it's not a job which I imagine that, that people would want to run. You're dealing with complaints day in, day out, it's difficult. But there is real scope in the skills which are developed there to be able to have interchange and development within the organisation. There's very little traffic between the two. Uh, and that, I think, is something which I think should be explored to look at how you can widen out the training, have more flexibility so that where you do have those challenges, you're able to draft in more staff from your complaints handling, which might have to go by the by, for uh, give yourself the resilience to be able to, de to deal more flexibly with that. The, the perks view was that they are just such different skills, and some, to some extent some of them are, but they're not so polarised that there aren't some aspects of an investigation that could be carried out. So you don't have to have everybody with a full range of policing skills. So if you look at the Procurator Fiscal Service, the F Procurator's Fiscals prosecute and investigate cases, but they also have precognition officers who don't go into court, who don't do the prosecutorial side of things, but in fact are very, very key to how you, you process that. So it doesn't all have to be done by the prosecutors. So it's looking at the the nature and makeup of that. That's why I make a recommendation also as part of it that there is a, a, a management consultant appointed to review the the way in which it is staffed, the, the profile of the staffing for the future with a new perk coming in. I think that would be invaluable as well to see what scope there is for looking at different ways in which the working is carried out in there to make it more effective, more attractive as a career as well. Thank you. Just one brief um, final question. Um, the press at the weekend seemed to pick up on the point that uh, the report says that um, police involved in an incident should be um, separated as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to avoid conferring, etc. I wonder mm -hmm. if you want to expand a wee bit on that. Yeah, yes, th th this isn't something new that I have said. I should just say that, and it doesn't relate to any any case, uh, 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 because my, there was some photography attached to it, which may have inferred that. In fact, the report that I did for the Home Secretary um, a, a few years ago, I looked at that particular case in the context of a, a number of deaths in custody which had occurred, uh, and some of them um, are obviously very notorious deaths. Uh, and the, the practice that, that was taking place there in England was that following such a, a death in custody, um, there would be, uh, the police officers would be brought together uh, and they would be uh, in a group subsequently, uh, very often with a senior officer present. Um, and I spoke to the Federation in uh, England and Wales about why, what was the objective of that largely. And they said, well, very much, he said, it wasn't, ever an exchange of opinion as to what happened, but sometimes they felt that they had to check their facts. Um, and that in itself is, is something that concerned me because th they, they had the view that unless they had uniform accounts of the event, that they, when they came to court, that the Crown Prosecution Service and others would uh, cross-examine them severely for having discrepancies in their accounts. And of course that's wrong because Nobody ever perceives an event in the same way. Uh, and discrepancies are natural. And if, if you have uniform accounts, if anything, it's going to be a matter of more suspicion uh, th th than uh, if there are discrepancies. And therefore, in a sense, that process in England and Wales, I didn't think was necessarily in the interests of, of those officers in that group. Um, equally, uh, if they are together, there is the danger of groupthink about innocent contamination of, it, uh, uh, of account and recollection. So it's really important, 
And I think this is not a criticism of police officers. It's important in the interests of those officers that following an event of this nature, that if it's traumatic, of course they must have support. They must have their welfare considered. They must have their uh, federation or Scaposa, whoever uh, representative present uh, if, if they require that. But putting them together in a room, I think it, it creates all sorts of difficulties because of the perception um, that, that if they are together, they will somehow uh, have the opportunity of influencing the account. Now, um, again, there may be an assumption that all of those officers have the same interests, but of course they don't. They're individuals, and in any legal context, if, if there is any potential conflict, you would have separate legal advice, because it's not necessarily the case that they all have the same, the same interests at heart. So there's all sorts of issues about that that make that process fraught, and the, the safest way, except in extreme operational circumstances, you've got to accept if it's a disaster. Uh, and, and there's a death, and then you're moving on to something else, you're having to save life. Not, this is not, again, a clinical exercise. It's really about if, it, if it's complete at that stage, uh, then that, that they should be so far as possible, and in the way that they would with civilian witnesses. If you do not interview civilian witnesses together. You keep, you keep them apart as soon as possible to get their own individual, however imperfect account, it's their account and it's their recollection that matters. And I think that's in the interest of police officers in the future. So it's not to say that they're, you, you ignore their welfare or their concern about the trauma that they've undergone, but that it's appropriate and that they're not simply put together in circumstances where it's very difficult for people, and then months later when it gets to any a case can be very difficult to rebut uh, you know, accusations which can be put uh, in the course of cross-examination. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Shona. Um, good afternoon. Uh, moving on um, to a very related area of uh, transparency. Um, an issue uh, which uh, has arisen is that, uh, that people don't feel that they're being given enough information uh, with which to pursue um, their complaint. It's been suggested that this could be improved by the, the policing bodies having a, a duty uh, to provide complainants with regular updates on the, the progress of their complaints, um, the procedures that are being followed, for example, and interestingly, um, provided with a named contact. Um, is that a, a viable suggestion? Yes, it is. And in some circumstances, it's a matter of law, because if there is a death uh, which is at the hands of the state, or alleged to be at the hands of the state, a death that's a death in custody, someone in a prison cell, someone in a police station or a car, any, any circumstance, then there is an obligation in the state to allow the family of the deceased, the next of kin, to participate effectively in the proceedings. So it's not a question of benevolence or, or giving them information. The family have a right to participate in those proceedings, and that means they must have uh, up-to-date information. They must be able to uh, understand the process. Now, there may be points at which it is sensitive uh, and it, it, where you're carrying out an investigation. And I make this comment regarding where allegations are made uh, based on a preliminary assessment, that the idea that that public statement immediately was put into the press, uh, that, you know, that an allegation which had proven would amount to gross misconduct. It was far too early a stage to make such a public comment and can create huge problems for witnesses coming forward. People are intimidated by that and by the officer the subject of that. Mm -hmm. So there are times when there has to be an investigation done a, not a, 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 in public because if I ask for a search warrant, I'm certainly not going to put it out and broadcast it. I'm going to someone's house to search the house. So that type of thing you, you has to take place in private. However, where it is possible to do so, then the family should be involved in consistently having information uh, about the development of the investigation so that they can participate. And when it comes to an inquest or a, a fatal acts inquiry in Scotland, uh, again, they must, again, have the opportunity to participate effectively in that. So that's for deaths. Then if you look at the rest of the spectrum, the more serious the event, then, of course, the higher level of participation that you would expect uh, and uh, a consultation. But the, the, the idea of having someone who deals with uh, all matters which are not, don't get beyond the, 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 the letter from frontline resolution where someone is satisfied, I think it's important yeah, that they have a contact person that they can come to. And I think that's something which I want to look at with uh, complainer groups and consumer groups as well uh, in the next part of the report, which will look specifically at the participation of those who are complainers. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that could be a very important uh, next step, I think, certainly from my own mailbag of um, police complaints over the years and might be shared by 
other committee members that 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 lack of communication and being kept informed is quite often at the heart of mm. f people feeling their complaint isn't being dealt with seriously. So I think it'll be interesting um, the the next steps on that. Um, moving on, we've began to touch on some of these issues earlier on, but. The, the Police, and, Police Investigations and Review Commissioner uh, has expressed concern about the, the level of discretion that Police Scotland currently has to categorise and investigate complaints in the first instance. Um, is that concern justified? Well, the, um, it would be justified if there's a, the copious evidence of there being issues where things which should be going to the park are not going to the park. And I think there was evidence, certainly, which uh, interestingly came from the complaints handling. And this is an example how useful the complaints handling side of things is, that where complaints were being made about the way in which a, a complaint had been handled came to the park's office, to her complaints handling team. They were able to observe that this should, in fact, not have uh, been dealt with by them, but it should have gone to the uh, procurator fiscal. Uh, and if that's an example of how the symbiosis between that complaints handling and the investigation team, in fact, are, are, I think are, are, are significant. Um, but the, um, in relation to the, the degree of discretion, I think the park herself gave evidence that she thought that the, there were a number of incidents where she would have liked to have been aware of uh, the nature of the incident uh, and the, where the chief constable hadn't reported it because he has a discretion as to whether to report these matters or not. You'll see from my report, my recommendation is that where the chief constable has such an incident, that he should consult the PERC in the future. And I, whether or not that, that re requires legislation is another matter, but it's a matter of good practice. It would make sense. And this is why the relationship is very important there. Uh, is that, uh, that they can speak to the PERC and say, I have this case, I'm considering the matter. Uh, and be able to discuss that in the way that a police officer would come into the procurator fiscal's office and say, I have a case here I'm considering, I'm not sure whether or not it amounts to X or Y. And that discussion is important. Uh, that's not an interference with the independence of the prosecutor. It's simply using that resource and that knowledge and having that working relationship, which is important. So I think I, I think that it's important all the, all matters that should go to the park do go to the park, and that's why you'll see I also make a recommendation that the all allegations of excessive force should go to the procurator fiscal mm -hmm. um, uh, for determination, so that that determination is not being made, because that could amount to a breach of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and that those allegations should therefore go to directly from the police to the procurator fiscal for the procurator fiscal to determine whether or not the PERC or the police can uh, investigate those matters, depending on how they, uh, they interpret the, uh, the evidence which supports the allegation at okay. that stage. I think that's... So there are certainly... I think there needs to be a sharpening up uh, of those matters to ensure that the, the concerns... The other aspect, however, that concerns me is that one of the best ways of detecting non-compliance with what really are intended to be uh, the areas of competence in each of the organisations is audit. And there's an underuse of audit. Uh, audit's not been used. One of the important powers of the SPA is to audit. You'll see in the report, it suggests that although audits have been carried out, they tend to be quite superficial uh, and statistical in nature. A more recent one I've looked at was excellent, uh, and it started to penetrate more uh, in relation to that. So that, that was a, a change there. But likewise, the, there have been audits carried out by the PERC, and one of the Three functions of the park uh, that are included are to audit and carry out research on uh, policy as well. Now, the research function has not been used, and the audit function of frontline resolution, for example, where a lot of the problems were uh, described by the park, has not been used since 2014. Now, if you are going to have those um, uh, decisions made at the, the front line by the, by the police, they should be subject to regular uh, audit. Uh, and I think the PERC has the power to do that and it could be done very effectively. Uh, likewise, um, research can be done uh, by the PERC. Now, the PERC's position regarding that is that she simply hasn't had the resources to do that. And she has made uh, a number of calls for additional resources. However, I, 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 when I did look at the complaints handling side of things, I, I referred back to a report that Robert Gordon prepared. Uh, he's a member of the committee the audit committee there some years ago when he, he looked at what he considered to be a bit of a council perfection in the complaint handling that even though the ground of complaint um, that the, ha uh, the complaint had not been handled correctly was not upheld, the PERC uh, staff would continue to 
look at other issues, which say failure to comply with the standard of uh, operating procedure, etc. Uh, and rather than spending that time on that, once you got to whether or not the, the complaint was good enough, whether or not other matters could go into a thematic, put it to the side, and these could be the subject of a thematic review thereafter, going to the Chief Constable rather than spending more time uh, going through each of these. Uh, and the important aspect of that is that that team should be doing more audits. Um, and I think they could be usefully doing more audits uh, than they've been able to do, perhaps because they've been spending too much or too long on the individual complaints. So I think that's looking at how you, you use the resources and what's most effective. The other suggestion I make in the report regarding this matter, uh, which is important, is that the Centurion computer system is the computer upon which all of these matters are entered by the frontline resolution. So they put them in. And I think there may well be a case uh, for giving the park access to the Centurion system so they can do contemporaneous audit as well from time to time. So they can dip in and look at what's happening to satisfy themselves. I'm not sure that finding uh, the uh, occasional breaches in itself suggests a major structural change uh, in who has responsibility for that. But I do think that the powers that are there uh, are, as I say in the report, they're not add-ons, they're actually a core part of it. And I think the, the, the use of audit, I think, is, is something which can be very effective uh, in beginning to, to, to secure better improvement. Or, sorry, great, great improvement. And just, just finally, and again, you have touched on this, um, the, the Commissioner raised a concern about the discretion given to Police Scotland in determining what constitutes a serious incident and whether to refer to Park for an investigation. Um, in uh, evidence, um, Ms Frame recommended that the term serious incident within the relevant regulations be amended to a potential breach of Articles 2 and 3 of the ECHR. Um, again, just to get your comments on the, the, whether the concern is justified and whether or not that's a step you think could be taken to resolve matters and whether there's anything else you want to... to Suggest. Well, I think I've answered some of that you in the previous answer, but I'd say yeah. regarding it, if it's a potential uh, breach of Article 2, which is death, that must be reported, mm -hmm. that must be reported to the Procurator Fiscal, as well as the Park. So that, and I don't think there's any suggestions of deaths that haven't, that mm -hmm. would be a very serious allegation, that have not been uh, reported. Article 3 is wider, that's inhuman degrading mm -hmm. treatment, an assault uh, or torture, um, or uh, de uh, treatment uh, which is... Uh, uh, highly injurious to an individual's well-being, and, and the vast bulk of those would be excessive uh, allegations, which sometimes have been packaged as excessive force when, in fact, they were assault, uh, and, and they should have been reported as an assault. So, in those circumstances, because of that, that's precisely what I have recommended: is that okay. that uh, excess, uh, allegations of excessive force should be reported to the PF. I, I, it's a long time since I've dealt with complaints against the police when I was deputy fiscal in Airdrie, um, but I do remember having these reports coming in from the police uh, to say that there was an allegation of those, and the procurator fiscal uh, who was in the custody would look at those to see whether or not we were concerned sufficiently to ask for a full report uh, regarding these matters at that stage. So that I think that that's something which um, certainly should be reinstituted, and that the fiscal gets to see these all, and the fiscal determines whether or not these go to the park directly. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Supplementary, Daniel, and then Maurice Corey. So just following up on, on, on your answers there about the, the complaints handling mm -hmm. process, and in particular, your, your key recommendations in terms of the concerns around uh, miscategorisation and so on are around audit and access to tune. I'm just wondering if you could just elaborate why you feel that that's sufficient. I mean, obviously, if the, the, the park or another body had a, a triage function, then they would be able to see the, the allegations firsthand rather than essentially mm -hmm. having to rely on, on the accounts themselves. And, and I just wonder if you could elaborate further why you, you felt that was, you know, these sort of second level um, access was sufficient. Well, partly because they've not been used yet. So I think what's important to do, because if we, if you move to that, the latter may well be an approach which would be acceptable. And I think the, the, the park feels strongly that, that she would like to sort of jettison that section, the complaints handling, uh, out to the Scottish Public Ombudsman. My concern about that is that policing and, and crime are, is quite a specialised area, uh, and my concern about it is dislocating it away from 
those who are investigating further, uh, and it's different from some of the other issues. Now, people might say, well, everything's special, you know, med medicine's special as well, but, but then you've got the issue about how do those people, again, keep up those, how, up their competence and understanding of that. So, that, so that's, so you'd be moving, it would be a 2 p issue, you'd have to move that group. And then if they, they, instead of that, the perk had the function of being the first instance front line, basically, in the eight odd. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a way, that's what happens in Northern Ireland, but of course that's because of particular sensitivity mm -hmm. uh, and the history of Northern Ireland, I think it was set up in that way. Uh, it could be done that way, but again, you have the issue that you have um, a bureaucracy you've created there because you then have to have a, a form of complaint against the handling by the park because they're now the people who are determining where this de uh, the destination is at first instance. And also, um, you, have a dis you have a dislocation from the ability to, to move as quickly as uh, you might. Now, you might say that you deal with these uh, every morning and, and you give out instructions, but some of them are not. You require further information. And what I observed, because I sat in, and I'm not sure if anyone else has come along, because I think it would be interesting for you to see these sergeants at work. The, as they're getting these, uh, the, these messages are coming in, some of them are ambiguous. Some of them are people who are in influenced by alcohol, that won't surprise you. But some of them are, you know, not necessarily as coherent. So they, they require some more exploration with the individual. And if it becomes apparent to the officer that what's been alleged is actually a crime as opposed to a, a frontline resolution matter that somebody, police officer Smith was rude to me. He didn't turn up in time. He didn't come to respond to my housebreaking. So these are sort of quality of service issues. But if it turns out to be something that's more than that, they then nip next door to the inspector uh, and they give it to the inspector who immediately puts it into an investigation unit to be investigated by, uh, as, a, as a crime as opposed to, uh, uh, or to go to the procurator for school. So, so there's that proximity uh, that allows that thing to go. I'm con slightly concerned that what we'd be creating is a very significant structural change, which I think could be bureaucratic and quite clunky um, if you look at it. And so, and when what we're trying to do is the vast bulk of these complaints do not relate to these matters. I think it's, you know, there's thousands of them, six thousands, but the vast bulk are of the, of the nature that PC Blogs uh, was arrogant, uh, mm. and uh, bullshit with me, uh, was rude, or he didn't come, it took him hours to come, uh, uh, and or the police didn't come, my house was broken into, the police didn't come for at least six days. That is the nature of it. And it's absolutely critical for those types of things, for the police organisation to, to be able to resolve that and improve itself. And I think to put it into another organisation and it, it, it is, to me, not necessarily logical nor has it yet been shown to be necessary. And I think that's the important point, as I say, is when you exhaust the other routes of possibilities of doing that, you can actually improve that, as well as improving, as I mentioned, the training of those who are at the front line to make sure that those skills are as good as they can be. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Demi. Um, <clears throat> are Police Scotland currently subject to any form of oversight uh, regarding the categorisation of any potentially criminal allegations? And is this something which should be subject to review? Well, yes, of course, they, they are under the direction and supervision of the Procurator Fiscal. Mm -hmm. That's that, and, the, and the prosecutor in Scotland is independent of the police and has a power to direct, which is something which we sometimes in Scotland overlook in terms of its significance, because if you're the Crime Prosecution Service in England, you have no power to direct the police. Mm -hmm. It is a Procurator Fiscal who has that role, uh, and that investigation of uh, the responsibility for investigating death which is a coroner's function, is also separated out in England. So you have unique in that role uh, a, a, a very powerful uh, organisation which is superintending the actions of the police uh, and of necessarily prosecuting the police. And you're well. happy that that's working okay? I think, <coughs> I, 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 I'm not suggesting there isn't any, I've not been asked to look at the pro procurator mm. fiscal service, that, that's excluded from my remit, but I, I didn't hear anything from the other organisations to suggest it was anything other than that, the CAT D unit, I think, is a huge improvement of what, mm -hmm. of what used to go before. And I think it was done in the, and I was a regional fiscal up in Grampian Highlands and Islands, and I, I had responsibility for those uh, at that stage, and I, for a very brief period when I was up there. However, um, I'd say that the new organisation uh, of having it all in the CAP D unit, led by a very senior prosecutor, provided it's properly resourced, and I think that more resources have come into it so that it's not a bottleneck of excellence, because you have to make sure that it is moving the cases through in the same way. Um, it is a, a very, very powerful and valid uh, check on, on police conduct. Thank you. Thank you. John? Uh, thank you, Camilla. A, a very brief question. Um, 
Damien Lish, um, it's a historic frustration that police officers have had that there seemed to have been a marked reluctance on the part of the prosecution to uh, instigate proceedings against those who make overtly malicious complaints mm -hmm. against officers. Now, accepting what you said about your agreement not covering that, or indeed giving direction to the Lord Advocate, would it be logical that with a, um, a more enhanced um, a, 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 and more robust complaint system that there would be more rigorous prosecution of malicious complainers as well, as, as a way of not only addressing a crime, but also um, you know, providing some comfort to, to those within the service? I, I, I think that it's important that we act on uh, efficiently and effectively in investigating complaints against the police. However, where those are found to be malicious or false, then I think there has to be a very important message there that, that there should be prosecutions. Indeed, I think there have. There have been two for wasting police time. Uh, by false accusation in Scotland over the, the last couple of years. Uh, but there's also attempting to pervert the course of justice depending on the stage of proceedings and what happens uh, in that. So I, th I think there is a, a, an important public interest, but that's a matter for the Procurator for Scotland for the Lord Advocate to exercise independently of any person, including me. So it, 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 but it is. What I do say in the report, however, is that regarding vexatious complaints, which may not be of... Uh, Criminal, con uh, criminal nature is that man many uh, of these uh, are received that are anonymous uh, and uh, you have an anonymous report and uh, how you deal with that is a matter of huge sensitivity as well because they can be anonymous for a very good reason but it also sometimes provides a cover for people who are vexatious uh, disgruntled uh, and it's really important I think that there is specific provision made regarding vexatious complaints which not of a not of a criminal nature but of a, of a nature of this uh, can be dealt with in, in any future amendment to this legislation because I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Just picking up on, on some of the, the various things that have been covered, um, in, in terms of the uh, Police Service of Scotland Senior Officer Conduct 2013 regulations, do you consider they should be amended in order to protect the, identify, the identity of uh, a very senior officer when they're, or senior officers when they're um, the subject of a complaint? I, I don't think, it, it, in the way in which it's put, I don't think that there should be a complete, uh, at that level of seniority, I think, if you, for instance, if it was me when I was Lord Advocate, then if there was, you know, if, if basically you were to to uh, drop a curly whirly wrapper in Sucky Hall Street, then it would be a matter for the news, uh, because you wouldn't expect that from the Lord Advocate, and it's a minor offence, uh, but nonetheless important. So there is an attachment. With that power comes huge accountability and visibility regarding that. However, where, a, uh, where the allegation is one based on a preliminary assessment, which is what the regulations provide for, and I've explored that in the, in the report, in other words, not one which is actually suggestive of active investigation. So you have the ipsa dixit of someone who may be anonymous. It could be scribbled, scribbled in the back of a you know bubblegum paper, whatever. Uh, it could be an anonymous uh, call. The, the obligation of the SPA at that stage is for them to pass that where they make a, a, a preliminary assessment uh, to the park. And if that then becomes public at that stage regarding uh, an individual by dint of the fact there's so few of them, so even if you don't name the individual, if there's only eight of you, then it, it can very quickly mushroom in such a way that can be hugely prejudicial, not just to the officer and their family at that stage when there is not even a prima facie case. You simply have an assertion at that stage. But it's also damaging potential witnesses who at that point uh, may not even have been seen by anybody uh, and therefore they may be cowed or intimidated by reference to the fact that it becomes public. I do, do therefore think that uh, it's not a question of that remaining so for the duration of it, but at that sensitive early stage of the proceedings when there is no prima facie case, it's simply an assertion, the, the, the investigation should be sealed at that point. And, and can I just tease that a little bit further? Um, I think you, you do recommend that when it's a senior officer, very senior officer, perhaps most senior officer being investigated, that that should be prioritised. Um, can you 
explain what you mean by prioritise, dealt with quickly or um, should there be some other mechanism there to deal with that level of complaint? Well, I, I don't think I need to speak to, to this audience here about the destabilising effect where you have such a small group, one, one force uh, in terms of the senior uh, command of the police if you have such investigations ongoing. And this is not about the, uh, the individual, it's not about their status that they should be given priority, it's about the destabilising potential it has uh, for, for crime uh, uh, and its investigation in this country, in the police force. And therefore it's important it's in the public interest that it's dealt with as quickly as possible, as is compatible with the evidence. Uh, and uh, the, the also that the in those circumstances that given that there is nowhere really for the officer to be repositioned, you can't put a chief officer into a post elsewhere, that we look at more creative alternatives other than simply suspension so that they could be seconded to uh, somewhere else, uh, a force out with Scotland or alternatively to a charity or some other organisation where they could potentially work pending an investigation, if that is considered to be the case, because while they're in position of power, it's very difficult uh, for for those investigations to take place. And that's another reason why, because of that, it has to be uh, done as expeditiously as possible. It's also in the interest of the public for that too. I, and did I see somewhere, I can't see the recommendation just now, that you were recommending that a chief constable, if they're asked for information, that must be provided to me as Yes, yeah. yes. In fact, I think I suggest, it, 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 I think within two it, two days, but, they, they, but I, I think that was apropos allegations of um, unlawful detention, which would be contrary to Article yeah. 5 of the European yeah. Convention, Article 3, the unlawful. The, the, the reason for that is that if it's not done quickly, you can lose a lot of evidence, particularly CCTV evidence. And there was examples from the park which she said that she had you know, these matters referred to her, but they were maybe six to eight weeks on, and then by that time, a very important evidence had been lost, and I think she, uh, she was quite right in saying that you know, it needs to be done quickly in order that she can uh, effect an effective investigation. I suppose one of the biggest questions in this whole um, review is c complaining can be a complex process. Mm. Uh, do you think there are immediate measures which could be taken to simplify the process and, and also to make sure the relevant st uh, stakeholders have done enough to make the, the public aware in plain language of how the, the process currently works? Well, I, I think I said somewhat facetiously in my report that it's almost like the Starship Enterprise in terms of its wiring. When you look at you know how you make a complaint, and and it's because it is complex. It's a very opaque. It took me considerable time to go because it's changed considerably since I've left Scotland in in terms of what what, what the new uh, landscape is. And it and I think I have to say I think that the, the current structures are a huge improvement in what I experience as a prosecutor. Uh, I think that the, the Unified Police Force makes eminent sense uh, and it, I think in fact with the passage of time will be tremendous uh, boon to the effectiveness of the police. However, it is, this is also obviously done quickly uh, at that stage and, and I think it's natural effort at this stage, at this juncture, we should look at it, to what extent the procedures can be simplified. But I certainly think one action which could be taken is to look at how we actually uh, direct people and the members of the public to how they can make a complaint and where they make. I looked at the website and I'm not the most IT friendly person on the planet, I accept that, but certainly I find it very difficult to navigate my way around that, to actually find the form. Even the form's not that obvious. And then of course, what if you're dyslexic? What if you have difficulties? Mm. How else can I make a complaint? But one thing that also troubled me is that if you don't want to make a complaint to the police, uh, what if you don't trust the police? What if you, you're worried about your safety and security? They can make, the members of the public can make a complaint straight to the procurator fiscal. Uh, and that's always been the case. And, and that's not obvious to members of the public they can do that. So they don't have to go through those processes. If, for instance, it's a concern about corruption or they, uh, or they feel concerned, they can go to the procurator fiscal. And I think there's also issues, which I'll come to later uh, in my consideration when I look at whistleblowing about the perk. Uh -huh being a nominated agency uh, regarding that too. And I think that that, uh, particularly for whistleblowing, might be an important matter in the future, but I haven't yet given uh, sufficient consideration to that aspect of matters. I did want to ask about uh, whistleblowing to see if um, the SBN Police Scotland's process just now was, was fit for purpose, but that's something for a later, yes, a later stage. Okay. Uh, Liam Kerr. Oh, did it again. <laughs> Liam McCarthy. I'm once. so sorry. <laughs> I thought I won't see MacArthur because I got it wrong last time. Is it three Sorry, times and it becomes harassment at work? I think. <laughs> um, 
I just want to touch on the issue of body-worn um, cameras. I think in, in your report um, you acknowledge obviously this is a, a wider debate and there are pros and cons uh, involved in it, but you, you make the point in relation to, uh, I think, the, the, the potential for reducing and resolving complaints and mm. they have, uh, to your mind, uh, a role to, to, to play in I think you're supportive of the, um, the Scotland's aspiration to, to roll out nationally. Um, can you maybe explain why that is, but also maybe um, uh, suggest what safeguards would need to be put in place in order for, for, for you to be satisfied that the, the benefits then outweigh uh, any potential downsides? Well, I, I, there certainly is uh, evidence already that so far as a uh, police officer is concerned that, uh, that, that the presence of a, cam a camera makes everybody behave better. You know the body-worn camera that, that those who who encounter as soon as they refer to the fact they've got one, uh, that, that, that it has a de-escalating impact on uh, some conduct. And Tulsa police forces referred to in the report, where in fact they, they had a very significant reduction in that type of conduct uh, as a result of uh, introducing them. My own experience of it is somewhat limited because they they, they weren't introduced uh, when I was in office or, a, or, or as a prosecutor, but CCTV evidence was transfor it transformed the investigation of crime. And there were some inhibitions at that stage about its efficacy or, and, and issues about Article 8 and privacy. But in fact, it has allowed us to detect, and I prosecuted a murder case where if it hadn't been for CCTV evidence, the case would have been so much more difficult to prosecute. Uh, and so it was amazing uh, how, how that has advanced things. And I think this is a natural extension of it. It'll be there to protect the public and it'll be there to protect the officer from false accusation. Uh, it, it should uh, assist in conduct. One example I, I, I give is when I was looking at the, uh, the police in England and Wales uh, and the way in which they deal with uh, uh, complaints made against them regarding deaths. I attended an inquest and the inquest related to a shooting by a police officer of a man in a tower block. Uh, and he gave his evidence, and I sat in the benches listening to his evidence, and whether it was nerves or whatever, when he gave his evidence about what happened, he described the scene uh, and how he came to discharge his firearm. His evidence was not, I thought, terribly impressive. I didn't know what to make, make of him, but he hadn't come across as an impressive witness. They then played his body-worn camera, which was outstanding in its quality, and showed how utterly terrorising this whole event was uh, and how quickly these events had transpired. And I think that had you had his evidence, it might have been perhaps not a different outcome, but not a, a more certain outcome. And I think that that convinced me alone of the value of having this for the police as well as for the members of the public. So far as the second issue that you mentioned is concerned about privacy, well, those are the concerns that it might, they might have. Uh, pick up third party uh, issues. But that was the same with CCTV cameras. And I think, therefore, there has to be a code of practice, a code of ethics about that, that where they do pick up that there's sufficient editing of anything, which, uh, at the end of the day, subject to agreement, of course, you can't edit anything out until Defence Council or uh, others have had an opportunity to see it in terms of the disclosure obligations. But subject to that, it, should, it would not be made public. But I, I, I take all those points, although there are still some anxieties around the proliferation of CCTV and, mm. and, and the locations in which mm -hmm. they're to be, uh, to be found. Similarly, I suppose, with uh, body-worn cameras, um, the, I think you refer to the, 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 the fact that um, deployment in the custody environment and the public-facing role, yeah. um, it, it can be the case that officers are the ones who are pro proactively engaging and therefore are proactively engaging with um, with cameras. I mean, are there particular safeguards that you would you would see as necessary in that? In, in, I'm in not that sure I understand. The point well, in, in a sense, the what um, uh, to, to what extent would the public need to be alerted that the engagement that they were having with with an officer hmm. um, was being recorded effectively? Well, it could be by a simple saying, body worn camera. It could be, you know, a, a declaration that's made uh, by the uh, the officer uh, that, that that you're in the presence of a camera, uh, and that in itself can have a, an effect uh, in terms of conduct, which is beginning to escalate into uh, into something. So the person is uh, put on notice. Uh, how practicable that is, however, if the circumstance is one of real fear and terror, you know, it's all very well us talking about this, and I therefore I would hate to think that the absence of that would therefore mean that that struck out the, the admissibility of any evidence gathered in that way. I think it would depend on the facts and circumstances of the case, but some, I think they do that with Taser, um, is that usually if, if they're 
beginning to present taser, they must, uh, they, uh, as part of their training, shout and warn that, you, that they're in possession of it. And they do the shout taser, taser, something like that. In, in the the uh, the videos that I've seen, although that might relate to the English piece, I'm not sure about the Scottish piece, but certainly that's the case uh, when I was looking at them for the Home Office. Okay. Just a point of clarity, Kate, um, do the police or do Police Scotland use body worn cam ca cameras at present? Do I think they do in a very limited scope, and I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's pilots which they've been running, and I think there's no question about it. I think the Chief Constable and others are very keen in having them. However, there are issues which you have to think about, not just the cost of it, but the effectiveness of make mm. sure that they're actually good value for money and they're not all going to you know, put it out after you know 18 months or something. And then there's a question about storage. And then there's a question about disclosure. Uh, and then uh, the use of them in courts and facilities and courts to be able to play this. All of those have a cost that has to be taken into account. And I'm sure the cost is not insignificant. And that's why I refer to public facing uh, in particular, rather than thinking about you know comprehensive rollout of it. But there's certainly, I think, if we were to roll ourselves forward 25 years, I would put my money on it that all officers would have body worn cameras when it will be very very much cheaper. It's a bit like mobile phones and tell you know other IT. I suspect it'll get cheaper the more people use them um, across the world. And given that it's a pilot. Does it matter that just now it is without a code of conduct? Is it without a code of practice for, for the bot? Well, I'm not sure. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I can look into that and write to you about that particular okay. point. Um, you, your final recommendation said that the Scottish Government could consider the case for amending legislation to put beyond doubt the definition of a member of the public who may make a relevant complaint. And dotted through the, the report, there are a number of recommendations for, chain, recommendations for changes in legislation which could be implemented relatively quickly mm -hmm. but have a major impact for improving the complaints process. Mm -hmm. So are you looking for, and it would be helpful I suppose to hear this, um, that these changes are made at pace? Mm -hmm. the, the they, they're important. For instance, the other thing is an officer serving with the police has been the subject of ambiguity. What does it mean? Is it a police officer uh, who was then serving with the police or is now serving with the police? Is it on duty, off duty? And of course, it's what, what you as a parliament want it to be. Uh, and I think what, what's important is it's put beyond doubt uh, as to what it could be, because there may be certain offences which police officers carry out in their private life, which have no nexus with their role at all. Maybe they, that they, um, I'm trying to think of examples, um, uh, they've kept an unlit skip or something like that when they've been moving house, which is an offence. There's a lot of minor offences which uh, could attract criminality, but there are others like careless driving. Now, if you're a traffic police officer, that might be significant, but if, if you're not, then it, it might not have any significance at all. So therefore, there's a spectrum as to whether or not you're interested in what persons do in their private life. But if they were dealing drugs, that certainly would be a matter of interest in their civilian capacity, and therefore you would, might want to ensure that that conviction would as it would would be brought into the uh, into the uh, misconduct proceedings where a conviction uh, would be proof of that matter. So, so uh, there are choices to be made there, and uh, as to what reach you want that to have, and what level of focus you want the organisations charged with looking at complaints against the police to be able to look at regarding the the, the private lives of of police officers. Yeah. And certainly, when the the committee took evidence there was kind of new nanos feeling from SPA from Police Scotland. I think the Cabinet Secretary too at that point that uh, there would be no uh, changes to legislation necessary. So, you know, given there are improvements that could be made re relatively quickly, I think it's maybe a question for the Cabinet Secretary when we see him tomorrow. Absolutely. Can I just finally ask you about the regional locations you suggest mm. for Park to operate, which I think is a, a good idea, but where would these be and, and how would that work? Well, I, I in, in fairness to the park, she did. She explained when I, I was surprised to learn, in fact, that it was located in Hamilton, and and, and the park explained very sensibly that Hamilton's a good place because it's on a motorway network. You can yeah. get to the east, you can get into the centre, etc. The difficulty you have is the northern. You know, we're a huge country geographically, but with a very small population, uh, and but but there can be very significant incidents can take place anywhere. And it's just about her ab the ability of her staff to be able to, to get coverage of the, the, particularly the northern and the, the islands. Now you can get flights, obviously, 
uh, up there. And even if you're up in Aberdeen, uh, it, it's not necessarily the case you can get to the islands if there aren't flights going. The reason is this, that they, if there is a, the most serious types of incidents which are alleged, then the park has a, an investigative role. And if there is a death, you have the golden hour it's referred to for collection and protection of evidence. It's really important that they get up there. Um, and therefore, I, I, I asked her whether or not she would consider. She didn't think it was necessary, but I think that as time passes, there's going to be more events. I think that the, the concentration in one place might create an issue in the future, which I think we should begin to anticipate. In the meantime, what I, I've looked at is the pragmatic options, which is that you have a network of procurators fiscal across the country mm -hmm. in the islands as well. And the procurator fiscal, of course, carries out the responsibility of the coroner. Um, it, part of the responsibilities of the coroner in England and Wales are carried out by the procurator fiscal. And therefore, it, it may well be that she might be able to secure an arrangement that the procurator fiscal attends the scene, which is what we used to do, and certainly we used to attend the scenes of murders and suspicious deaths. Uh, and you would go out there uh, uh, while the police were in attendance at that stage to superintend what was taking place to ensure uh, that the investigation was under that form of supervision until the perk arrived. That might be, but that's a matter between those two organisations uh, to deal with in the meantime. But certainly at this point in time, the perk's not equipped to be able to deal with something uh, as urgent that takes place uh, out with, and even two, two to three hours can be problematic if, if we're talking about uh, a death. Yeah. It didn't even seem to be the, the time, it seemed to be the, the volume of, of work that, that Burke had. There seemed to be huge backlogs too, so for a number of reasons that would seem to make sense. Mm. If there are no more questions? No. Can I thank you very much for, for coming today and giving up uh, your, your time and um, to the members too for fitting in an extra committee meeting which has been so worthwhile. Our final meeting uh, before summer recess will be tomorrow 10am when we will continue our evidence taking on Damien Eilish and Giulini's report by hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. We'll also take evidence from members of the Scottish Government Bill team for the, uh, for the Scottish by Metric Commissioner's Bill as part of our approach to considering that bill. And I formally close this meeting.